I just wanted to thank uh, the Autism Science Foundation, um, not just for supporting my work for this coming year, but it's also really an honor to be a part of this event. Um, my project is designed to offer a population perspective on how autism diagnostic criteria are being uh, observed in, in a population of, uh, of children and thinking about what features are most commonly observed and described or um, also uh, whether certain features uh, are associated with an earlier identification of autism. Uh, awareness campaigns like CDC's Learn the Signs emphasizes identifying certain behaviors that research has shown to indicate autism at a very early, early, very early age, but there really isn't a lot of information on whether this holds true in practice in, in the general population. And so a big part of my motivation for this project is that oftentimes we don't fully consider the phenotypic variability and, and diversity among people with autism and uh, this quote from Eric London, I think, really succinctly describes the, the sentiment and, and by taking advantage, or <laughs> taking, advantage uh, taking for granted the um, diagnosis, we're really just kind of lumping everything that's on the spectrum in together when we know that there is a huge range of different criteria. We, we suspect that there are multiple causes. And so having some way to look at these traits either individually or in combination with others uh, could really have a lot of, of scientific utility and also advance our understanding of autism. And so in epidemiologic studies, uh, autism is often just considered a dichotomous outcome. We have a group of people with autism and we have a group of people that don't have autism. And then we're trying to see if there's some relationship uh, between the two or if, um, if there's some exposure that, that's more common in, in the autism group or if autism is more common in the exposed group. And by failing to go beyond this categorical description of autism, we are also unable to address questions related to disability beyond just etiology, such as thinking about functional limitations, participation restrictions that have a lot of public health utility. And so I think part of the challenge is, is that there's really no good way to, to try to subdivide or categorize autism spectrum disorders. I think the most common way in a lot of studies is taking autistic disorder versus the rest of the spectrum. Um, but the DSM-5 work group described this as uh, equivalent to trying to cleave meatloaf at the joints. Um, I think that's the first time I've ever heard that expression, but it makes <laughs> sense too. Uh, other times people characterize their uh, study populations as having full spectrum or high functioning autism. Observational studies often rely on existing data sets and so if that's based on service or school eligibility, all those things that are being, the, the requirements for these services are also affecting who we're calling a case or not a case. And I think part of the difficulty in trying to, trying to separate these different groups is the way that the diagnostic criteria are structured. And I think it might be worthwhile to look at these diagnostic criteria both individually and in combination with each other uh, to see what we find and so if you, if you look at the DSM-4 criteria for autistic disorder versus, say, PDD-NOS, um, you'll see that it's not really that the impairments differ in necessarily in, in different domains. It's really just the number of symptoms that are responsible for, for this distinction. And so the way this is, uh, the, the way these criteria can be met also uh, provides a lot of flexibility and probably contributes a lot to the variability that we see in the autism spectrum. So for example, if you take autistic disorder, uh, you have to have two or four items in the social domain uh, and then one impairment each in the language and behavioral and then another two that could come from anywhere for a minimum of six of 12. So if you think about all the different combinations and ways that these criteria can be combined to meet the diagnostic criteria for autism, actually does anybody know the number? Any guesses there? Any? It, it's actually 616 different ways <laughs> that, um, that you can arrive at, at, the, at this diagnosis according to the DSM-4. And what I did here is this is a network graph uh, using our population-based data, which I'll describe in a moment. But each node on this graph represents a different combination of six items that would meet criteria for autistic disorder uh, and then 
the lines between each node represent that there's a large number of cases that would be shared between the two. So they meet, they meet the criteria in more than one way. And so you can really see, I think this graph, I mean, it's a work in progress, and obviously there aren't all 616 up on, up on the screen. I couldn't, couldn't make it fit. But um, I think it really illustrates the, the point that if you're trying to group this population by a single characteristic, it might not really be telling the entire story. And so for this analysis, I'll be using the 2006 Adam Network data. And the Adam Network is the CDC's population-based autism surveillance network. And uh, this is the same data that was featured in the prevalence report from last December. Um, one of the really, I think, important features of the Adam Network is that the surveillance case definition is made independent from the uh, existing from having an existing diagnosis so overall we have over 2700 children that meet surveillance uh, case definition for being on the spectrum but not all of them have been formally diagnosed by by a professional and so then for each child we know uh, at each evaluation which DSM criteria and which behaviors were described how old they were whether they had a, a diagnosis or wh whether a diagnosis was made at the time as well as other demographic and, uh, and co-occurring features. And so to, to determine which features or whether certain features are in practice related to earlier identification, uh, I propose to use two different analytic approaches that I, I think are really complementary. Um, I think in, in epidemiology, the regression and survival-based analysis are usually the, the typical approach for uh, for trying to, to, to look at a problem like this. But one of the limitations of regression or survival analysis is the inability to really account for complex interactions and the inability to interpret you know, when there might be three, four, five, six different variables interacting with each other. And that's really a strength of the random forest algorithm. And random forests are probably most often used in uh, genetic studies where uh, hundreds of thousands of genetic markers are being uh, accounted for simultaneously and you're trying to deal with this really highly dimensional data structure. And so I thought that instead of using this on genotype data, I thought it'd be interesting to use this approach as sort of a confirmatory analysis to uh, try to make sense of the high dimensionality of the autism phenotype. And then, of course, I think the real challenge will be trying to reconcile these two approaches in a way that makes sense and, and is easy to to explain to people. And so I think that this is one way that epidemiology and population-based studies can really contribute and, and complement to the, the work that's going on in, in uh, clinical and, and basic science research. And that really by starting to think about you know, how we're arriving at these diagnoses, how we're characterizing this population, uh, just really going beyond simply counting children is uh, going to be increasingly important, uh, especially thinking about how we communicate findings to the public and just really furthering our understanding of autism. And so just uh, to recap, the, I have three overall goals. Uh, just the first is really descriptive to find out, you know, how are these children meeting criteria? Uh, are there certain patterns that are a lot more common that are being described a lot more often? Um, are demographic differences uh, real that have been identified in, in clinical studies? Uh, and then to see whether certain certain patterns or features are predictive of earlier diagnosis in the population. And then finally, I think to really take these lessons and, and apply them to uh, you know, future study years, thinking about the transition to DSM-5, how that's going to change, how we perceive, who has autism, who doesn't, and then also applications for different, different aspects of disability, like thinking about service utilization, and things like that. Uh, I want to acknowledge my dissertation committee uh, and especially Maureen Durkin, who has been my advisor and mentor for years. And also, uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, collaborating with the other Adam investigators. They've, uh, I, I think this, they, they've indicated that they're interested in working this, uh, with this, and I'm uh, looking forward to engaging them this summer. <laughs>